Thank you very much, Kristen, and welcome everybody um, to our presentation today. Uh, last October, we, we did a presentation on our Workforce Insider where we talked about labor negotiation strategies. So I'm hopeful that we have some repeat customers here with us today. Um, but equally important to developing appropriate labor negotiation strategies given the new um, employment situation that local government employers face is making sure that we are prepared um, on a financial level to make long-term sustainable uh, decisions as it relates to um, um, our, our, our bottom line. So today we're gonna be talking about fiscal resiliency, assessing local government recession readiness. I wanna start by helping to define what is a recession. Um, the National Bureau of Economic Research, known as the NBER, has a business cycle dating committee that is the official recession scorekeeper. Uh, the NBER defines a recession as a significant decline in economic activity that is spread across the economy and that lasts more than a few months. Some of you may have re remember earlier this year, there was some discussion about whether or not the U.S. had entered a recession when we experienced two negative quarters of GDP growth. Um, while that may be a contributing factor to determining when we are in a recession, it is not the ultimate or, or single factor that the NBER considers. Their view is a little more broad, and it's that they need to have um, three criteria met, depth, diffusion, and duration. And while each of those criteria need to be met to some degree, extreme conditions revealed by one criterion may partially offset weaker indications from another. And that data really emerges when you look at um, the COVID recession, what I'm terming the COVID recession, which started in February of 2020 um, and lasted only a short period of time through April of 2020 at the onset of the COVID pandemic and the following lockdowns that occurred. The NBER looks at a number of factors when they're deciding whether or not the U.S. is entering a recession. Those factors include uh, employment levels. They look at industrial production and manufacturing. They look at personal income, personal consumption expenditures, which is a measure of growth in consumer prices, as well as growth and change in gross domestic product. Um, the COVID recession was sudden and severe, and that's really evidenced just by this chart that shows U.S. employment levels um, pre and post recession. And you can see that it was uh, a very significant drop, but didn't last that long. It started to uh, creep back up um, within just a few months. Um, and so it is generally shorter in duration and less diffuse than other recessions. Some industries not really impacted at all by the COVID recession. Others were impacted more severely, such as the tourism and hospitality industry, where restaurants, hotels were, were forced to close and shut down completely. It's important to look at um, the duration of contractions and expansions over time when you're assessing recession readiness for a local government employer. And what you see, if you just look at the last 50 years or so of recessions, is that the duration will vary quite significantly. Um, as I mentioned before, the COVID recession lasted only two months. Leading up to the COVID recession from June 2009, which was the trough, the bottom of an economic cycle, through February 2020, which was the peak, um, that was the longest U.S. Uh, expansionary period on record. And these records go back to the you know 1850s. So um, a very long period of economic growth lasting nearly 128 months. Uh, but not every recession will last that long. Because the NBER uh, depends on government statistics that are reported at various lags, it does not designate recessions until after they start. So it's always done on a delayed uh, perspective. And this uncertainty underscores the need for local government employers to develop scenario analysis and planning in order to quickly pivot during periods of economic contraction. Um, we know that we have revenues that are economically sensitive. Some are not. Property taxes, for example, tend to be a lagging um, indicator of recession, right? It takes a while for changes in property values to make their way through the rolls. 
other taxes, like sales taxes, for example, are more economically um, linked to what's happening in the broader economy. And when you look at one-off um, recessions like the COVID recession, certain business taxes, hotel taxes are incredibly economically sensitive. So understanding that there are differences across recessions in their duration, their depth, um, is really important for local government employers and to really set up scenarios and analysis in order to get quickly. Uh, We're currently in a period where there's a lot of uncertainty, significant amount of uncertainty. The FOMC, which is the Federal Open Market Committee, has been raising interest rates. I think everyone is aware of that. Uh, the federal fund rate is the central interest rate in the U.S. financial market, and it indirectly influences many other long-term rates, such as mortgages, loans, and savings, all of which are very important to consumer wealth and confidence. Um, when the FOMC believes that the economy is growing too fast and inflation pressures are inconsistent with the Federal Reserve's dual mandate of keeping inflation low, they target a 2% inflation factor, and maximizing employment, they begin to raise uh, the, the federal fund rate in an effort to slow down and hamper economic activity by taking liquidity out of the market. Um, and the chart that you see here shows you the federal fund rate since 2000, leading up to each of the three prior recessions, including the COVID recession. And noticeably what you see is a very significant and steep uptick in the rate and pace at which the Fed has raised interest rates in order to combat um, inflation, which is one of their, their um, core focuses. As you all know, inflation pressures um, are at a 40 year high. They were at a 40 year high earlier this year. Um, they're beginning to ease from their 2022 peaks, but they still remain at very elevated levels. The data below is shown as of December 2022 for the U.S. national average, and it's not seasonally adjusted. Um, and no matter which measure of the CPI, the consumer price index, you look at, you can see that inflation is, is still running high. Again, down from its 2022 peaks of 9, 8.5 to 9%, um, but it's still running anywhere from 6.3 to 6.5%. The 12-month change in CPIU running at 6.5%, the 12-month change in CPIW at 6.3%, and the 12-month uh, change in chained CPIU at 6.4%. The chained CPIU um, is a little different than the other two measures in that it takes into account substitution of goods. Normally, inflation is measured by looking at a market basket, and that market basket doesn't change over time in order to assess how much prices have, have changed. Um, but consumers being reasonable people in response to rising prices often change their behaviors. And so the change CPIU will substitute if beef prices rise uh, for consumers spending more on chicken or pork or some other um, uh, poultry or dish that they, that they like. Um, and that's not to single out the, the meat industry in, in, in any particular way. Um, but what you see here is that all of these measures, including the measure that takes into account substitution across goods, um, they're all running about the same. And, and it really underscores the fact that many products, many goods and services um, are, are experiencing a rapid uptick in price. Um, and I don't know if folks still read comics anymore, but the, the Dilbert comic that we have here on the uh, slide rings true. Um, many government employers, many employers, both public and private, are dealing with a situation in which they're giving raises that are not commensurate with the change in uh, CPI, resulting in a net pay cut for their workforce from a um, spending capacity, right? How much can I continue to um, um, spend at the same rate, or is my purchasing power diminished because my raises aren't keeping pace with what's happening um, in, the, uh, in the price of, of goods. Um, and that's a difficult situation to be in for local government employers, particularly when you're negotiating. So if you're in a union environment, uh, this can be a particularly challenging circumstance to navigate. One of the strategies that we talked about in our workforce um, insider was looking at how your wage increases have um, performed 
over a longer period of time, right? There may be historical periods where you've given increases that exceed the inflationary pressures. And so now you're just making up the difference in a way. Um, so important to take a long-term perspective if you are facing a situation like this. Which really leads us to our first poll question, which is what growth rate are you assuming for labor costs? And we're looking at total personnel costs in your fiscal 23-24 budget. Zero to three percent, four to five percent, or six percent or more. We'll give everyone just a minute to respond. The responses are still coming in. We should have put a don't know option here, but if you don't know, I, I guess just take your best estimate. We'll give it just another 15 seconds. Great, thank you, Kristen. So pretty much aligned with what we would expect. You have 31% uh, coming in at zero to 3%, four to 5% um, growth rate has about 50% response rate and 6% or more. Um, is at a 19% response rate. So I, I would assume this is agencies anticipating um, increased pressure to deal with labor demand, but maybe not having the financial capacity um, to, to go all the way and meet exactly what uh, their employees are demanding. Um, and uh, some of this, I wonder is, is whether or not pension costs, the, 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 any uptick in pension costs as a result of recent market volatility has been fully baked into current person, you know, current unfunded liability amortization, um, but pretty pretty much where I would expect um, the results to be. We can close this for some, move on to the next slide. The other mandate that the Fed looks at is the job market. And um, contrary to what's happening with inflation, uh, you see that the US has a strong labor market and it's really evidenced by a very low unemployment rate. The total non-farm payroll increased by 223,000 in December, and the unemployment rate actually edged a, a little down, downward to 3.5%. Uh, there were notable job gains in December reported in leisure and hospitality, healthcare and construction, and social assistance. So a little choppy, not everyone experienced the same rate. Um, what you do see when you look over a longer term period is that despite the very significant uptick during the height of the COVID pandemic, where the unemployment rate was over 14%, it very rapidly declined. And as of December, it's really where it was uh, pre-COVID recession, right? And this can have an impact on decisions that the Fed are making in a, in a couple of different ways. Um, as long as employment is good and inflation is high, we can anticipate the Federal Reserve to continue raising interest rates. At the pace at which they do that is still to be decided and they've signaled that and they have started to slow down the rate at which they're increasing. Uh, but I do anticipate and many economists are anticipating that to continue to happen over the course of the next year. The Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia publishes a survey of professional forecasters, and uh, it's the oldest quarterly survey of macroeconomic forecasts in the United States. And what we see emerging is that economists are starting to see a greater risk of a contraction in real GDP in 2023, despite the data that came out today of, of, of over uh, good growth at Q4 of 2022. Um, they're almost at a 50% chance, ranging from a low of 43.5 to a high of 49.4% chance that we will see a negative quarter of uh, a contraction in GDP in 2023. And the chart here that you see that shows the anxious index shows you where the economists were forecasting for the probability of a decline in GDP uh, back to 1968. 
Um, and every time you see a pretty significant spike um, in the economist outlook, how anxious are they about how well things are gonna be over the next year is, is followed by a recession, which is highlighted by those, by those gray bars. So while no one has indicated that we're in one now, um, there's certainly some agreement among economists, or at least we can all point to the fact that more economists are pointing to a real risk of a contraction in GDP as we approach um, and, and are in 2023. Resiliency um, is defined as an ability to recover from or adjust easily to adversity or change. And in, in response to the economic conditions and considerations that many local government employers face today, being a resilient organization, being able to recover or adjust easily to some outside change or adversity that you face is more important than, than ever before. And so that's why we titled this fiscal resiliency because we just want to put the word financial in there, but it's important for finance officers to lead the charge and be the ones developing plans, developing um, scenario analysis, that help them to be able to recover quickly in the event of, of a downturn or contraction in the overall economy. Assessing local government fiscal resiliency is difficult to do. Um, this is a chart that comes from the National League of Cities. They have a report called the uh, City Fiscal Condition Survey. In 2023, seven out of 10 city finance officers reported being better able to meet their fiscal needs in 2023 relative to 2022. Those finance officers cited uh, strong city tax base, growing federal aid, and, and a strong health of their local economy as the most helpful factors. And they pointed to inflation, employee wage needs and salaries, demands from labor unions, or the need to give raises just to maintain competitive so that they can hire individuals, as well as infrastructure needs and the supply chain issues that folks are having with uh, the, the infrastructure needs as the most hindering factors to their long-term financial health. If you just go back to the 2022 survey, almost nine out of 10, so only one finance officer reported not being able uh, better able to meet their financial needs in 2022. So that has, has begun to come down and we suspect, I suspect that that's in response to uh, some of the economic indicators that are coming out today, but it's still a significant improvement from what you saw in the 2020 survey results in which nearly eight out of 10 finance officers, almost 80% said that they were less able to meet their financial needs in 2020 than, than they were in the prior year. In order to help develop a resilient financial organization, it's really important and critical for finance officers to explore multi-year financial planning. And they do that first by developing a baseline forecast. Uh, we recommend that you start with a baseline forecast that uses realistic expectations for revenue and expense growth under normal economic conditions, typically over a five or 10 year period the baseline forecast is essentially a status quo or carry forward projection that assumes no changes in service levels unless required by law and without corrective balancing actions. A baseline scenario, a baseline forecast should incorporate known and likely expenditure increases over the, the forecast timeline, such as pension costs, as well as debt service payments. And it should also capture contractual obligations such as multi-year labor agreements with settled across the board wage increases and benefit enhancements. So to the extent that you have a five-year contract or a four-year contract or three-year contract with your unions representing police officers or firefighters, you would wanna make sure that you're very familiar with those MOUs or those labor agreements and that you're building in any of the contractual obligations that you have. You would also wanna make sure you're capturing in your baseline forecast service level mandates. So essentially you would look for things that are being forced upon you by a county, by a state um, that you're going to need to absolutely grapple with over 
the forecast horizon. A good example of this um, uh, that comes to mind is uh, California, the state recently shut down its juvenile detention center, which a lot of small counties used um, if they had to make a placement of a, a youth offender. Um, when that facility closes down, these small counties that don't have their own facilities are going to need to find ways to place individuals in, in other areas, right? So that is a mandate that they're going to absolutely have to grapple with. It's not necessarily a status quo or carry forward um, expense, but they do need to spend this money and they're going to have to find alternatives and those alternatives may cost them more. The benefits of a multi-year financial plan are many. Um, but one of the most important is that it infuses strategic decision making into the budget process. It's making sure that you're assessing decisions that you make today and their long term consequences over uh, a period that goes beyond your your current budget year. Um, it also um, helps to foster buy in with key stakeholders and can provide context for current budget decisions. Um, I was a budget director in a, in a large city and a finance director in a large city, and there was never enough resources to meet all of your needs. And so when individuals, whether they were advocates, your council members, your elected officials, um, see available resources and there's a need in the community, they might want to spend it. Multi-year financial planning can help you to understand why maybe it's not in your interest to spend that money on a particular need, even if it does exist and it's real and it's a problem, um, making sure that the decisions you're making are sustainable over a long period of time are, are equally as important. And so multi-year planning can help you address that challenge. When you're developing your baseline forecast, it can also help you to identify current and projected structural deficits. This is a chart that I pulled from a multi-year forecast uh, from a California agency, and it can just show you that this, this entity was facing major deficits over the next five years, shrinking deficits as revenues were anticipated to grow and rev, uh, expenses were, were leveling off, um, but significant challenges that you already may be facing, right? Are you structurally balanced or do you already have problems? Are you relying upon one-time revenues for ongoing costs, which is never a good situation to be in. Um, it also helps you to assess your anticipated pace of growth in revenues relative to that of expenditures. In normal times, um, I've seen municipal revenues grow at about the rate of your long-term average inflation, anywhere from two to 3%. Expenses, driven mostly by active and retiree medical benefits, as well as pension costs, growing almost at double digit rates in response to market losses, um, in response to right sizing their actual assumptions um, and, and so on. Um, but it's important to really use your baseline forecast to communicate what are the key categorical drivers um, and, and, and so that you can isolate them, have conversations about them, and look for alternative solutions to how you deal with those issues. Assessing your available fund balance and reserves is also a good thing to do when you're developing your baseline forecast. Um, how much do you have, and is it sufficient to cover your current needs? And do you need to develop more rigorous financial policies about how you use fund balance or how you use one-time revenues um, in order to promote a long-term financially sustainable, financially sustainable organization. And then lastly, when you're developing your baseline, it's also important to make sure that you're really articulating the starting point for your analysis. Some entities that I have worked with will start their forecast as a preliminary budget before they've taken balancing actions, and it shows many, many years of gaps at that point, but they, they oftentimes have to take corrective action. So oftentimes I recommend that you do it after your budget is balanced. Um, so your adopted budget should be your, your starting point, and then you adjust um, in each year thereafter. And that brings us to our second polling question. 
Kristen, if you could pull that up for me. Do you have a multi-year financial plan? Single choice, yes, no, I'm not sure. We'll give everyone a few minutes. Do you have a multi-year financial plan? Single choice. We had 55% of respondents say yes. I'm glad that those folks have one because I, I would highly recommend it. 26% um, said no, and 18% said they weren't sure. Um, I'm not surprised by these results. Um, multi-year planning is difficult time consuming, it could take a substantial amount of bandwidth um, to produce and to produce right. I, I would say I've seen a lot of uh, municipalities, particularly West Coast municipalities, where they have a multi-year forecast, uh, but it doesn't really have a commensurate financial plan attached to it. Um, and and, and I, I do wanna distinguish a little bit between multi-year planning and multi-year forecasting. I, we use the terminology um, interchangeably, but a forecast that shows out your gaps, that doesn't attach um, balancing solutions, doesn't analyze scenarios, doesn't run options or explore options or consider changes in service levels, um, is, is probably insufficient to really call a plan, right? So there, there, there may be some folks who, who have a forecast, but maybe they don't have a long-term financial plan. All right, Kristen, if you could, thank you, close that for me. And we do have one question. Sure. Coming coming in from Adam, or excuse me, Jordan. Um, is a capital improvement plan somewhat the same? Yes, I mean, capital improvement plans should be built into your long-term forecast. Um, and capital expenditures by nature happen over a multi-year period. So yes, absolutely. You need to assess your capital needs. If you already have a CIP, um, my, I would suspect that that CIP is going to have many expenditures that are going to cover a multi-year period of time. Um, building those things into your long-range financial plan is absolutely critical, particularly if those things are not funded, right? If they're mandates or their health and safety, life health and safety issues that you're absolutely going to need to do, and you don't have a financial uh, capacity to do it, that's a great thing to reflect. And, and capital needs are probably um, an area where local governments today are, are struggling the most. They have not recapitalized assets as they should, street conditions, roadway conditions um, across the country um, are, are not great, right? They could certainly be better. Facilities are old um, and they're not meeting um, modern standards. And so a lot needs to be invested. But yes, yeah, so a CIP is absolutely a plan. And I think that needs to be integrated into the long-term financial plan. Great question. Um, once you've developed your baseline forecast, again, that, that carry forward, that status quo assessment of your underlying financials, um, it's really important to um, develop scenarios for your revenue outlook under alternative economic conditions, including, um, importantly, simulating the impacts of a recession. Keep in mind, as we said earlier, not all recessions are the same with respect to their depth, right? How bad will things get? How, how high will the unemployment rate go? Diffusion, what sectors of the economy will they hit? Will they, will they impact the local government sector at all? And of course, duration, how long will they last? COVID pandemic recession was very small. Great recession, one of the longest on um, record. And so it may be beneficial to have multiple revenue scenarios where you're looking at normal expectations for a, a recession, but also severe um, recessions. In the past, most finance officers really said you couldn't forecast for black swan events. Um, I think the COVID pandemic has changed some of folks' perspectives on how severe of a recession you might need to simulate. Um, but in any circumstance, when you're stress testing your revenues as a scenario, it's important to really clearly outline all of your economic assumptions, the timing of downturns, 
the, the breadth, the depth, the duration, as well as the anticipated recovery. Um, the COVID pandemic for me highlights that some local government revenue streams are more sensitive than others. Said this earlier, property taxes tend to be a lagging indicator. They're a little more stable um, depending on your geographic location. Some states, it's a, it's a little different than others in how they set up property taxes. But it's important that you don't just take a broad perspective and look at revenues categorically and say, well, here's a recession, we're gonna assume 3% decline. I think it's really important to independently evaluate and you can pull in your, your, your tax consultants, I know a lot of folks have them, um, to look at sales taxes, property taxes, business license taxes, property transfer taxes, if it's a housing-based um, recession, and hotel taxes. And that no two organizations will produce the same outcome when they're stress testing their revenues. Um, a great example of this, I, I recently worked with the city of Monterey, California, and the city of Santa Clara, California, two um, entities that rely heavily. I think their budgets are 30% uh, of their revenue sources, maybe more, come from hotel taxes. One, Monterey is a tourism-based hotel tax, right? It is on the beach. It has a conference center. The other, Santa Clara, is in Silicon Valley. Their hotel taxes were predominantly driven by um, business travel. Right? They both relied on them equally for their general fund operations, uh, but they weren't the same in terms of their recovery. Um, when, when the shutdown sort of eased and the vaccines rolled out and the tourism industry picked back up, the occupancy rates in Monterey recovered at a pretty substantial pace. And I would guess at this point, um, they're already nearing where they were pre-pandemic, maybe a little down from where they were, um, but they've closed a, a significant amount of that gap. Business travel hasn't really rebounded uh, to the same extent. And so you have a city in you know, Silicon Valley that uh, is really grappling with a new normal, right? A new normal that allows individuals um, to work remotely and they've gotten good and uh, at, at getting on Zoom calls and they'd rather not get on an airplane um, and, and fly to a hotel if, if they can have an effective conference uh, via, via web. So, and I think the other thing that jumps out here is that even under sort of modest scenarios where you're maybe not sort of declining your revenues by a significant amount, um, but where you're either just going flat or, or a slight decline, it can really impact your, your underlying results. And this is just a hypothetical simulation that I did, but, you know, this entity um, was anticipating, you know, a a $5 million increase from year two to year three in their revenues. And now they're actually experiencing a roughly 2% decrease. That's a delta of about six to 7% that they now need to figure out how to um, address. So even minor changes in your, your underlying circumstances can really drive overall results. So stress testing revenues is really important to do um, and outlining how you're doing it. All of the assumptions that you're making are, are critically important. Similarly, it's important to stress test your expenditures. Labor costs assumptions can go beyond contract years, right? So what if there are, um, you have a 10 year forecast and labor costs are only um, known for the next three. Uh, what is the impact of general wage increases above your assumptions in your baseline? If your baseline assumes wages will grow by 2%, um, but they actually close and, and close closer to 3 or 4%, what does that do to your underlying financial position? Does that increase your reliance upon one-time money? Are you going to use fund balance sooner than you thought or exhaust fund balance sooner than you thought? Um, what is the likelihood that pension costs are higher than your baseline assumptions? This chart here shows a history of investment returns in the CalPERS system, the largest municipal uh, pension system in the country. Um, and, and you can see that their, their results have been choppy. Um, it's hard to see some of the years, but in 2020, they returned 4.3%. That was a couple percentage points less than their assumed rate of return. They rebounded substantially in 2021 and returned 21.3%. Which triggered a 
reduction in their assumed actuarial rate of return prospectively. But in 2022, which is not shown in this chart, they reported out just at the end of last fiscal year, uh, they reported a 6.1% loss. Um, and the gains that they had from 2021 all but wiped out. You know, if you're assuming that you're going to get 7% approximately and you actually get 21, that's a delta of 17 or 18%. If you're assuming you're going to get 7% increase in return on your investments and you actually lose 6%, that's a delta of about 13%. So it's simple, I'm simplifying the math here. Um, but pension costs can have really significant impacts based upon current results. So understanding how those things are gonna change and what is the impact of a multi-year period of uh, lower than expected investment returns? How will that drive your expenditures? Um, that's an important stress test to, to put into a scenario and into your, your forecast. And of course, rate increases for active and retiree medical costs. Um, the medical trend rate has somewhat subsided, uh, but we anticipate that to still run higher than general revenue growth and inflationary pressures. Looking at your fixed costs, even if they're not entirely unchangeable, it's I've always found it difficult to talk about fixed costs, uh, but things like utilities, what if fuel costs continue to rise at you know, their uh, current pace, uh, fuel, debt service payments, and other unforeseen mandates, service level changes, what impact do your economic scenarios have on services? Um, this is an important thing to consider in the context of simulating a recession. Does a recession result in an increase or decrease in demand for the services that your organization delivers? It's not easy to say in the aggregate because each agency, and I'm sure many agencies on this call, have, have different services that they're providing, but social services certainly may see an uptick in the need to provide services in the event of a very severe downturn um, and service delivery efficiencies, of course. And then um, as we talked about a little bit earlier, spurred by the question, the impacts of fully funding your capital improvement program, right? What do you need to recapitalize assets that you haven't been investing in? And have you completed a capital needs assessment this is a good time when you're developing your expenditure forecast to look at those things baseline that you're going to fund, that you already have the authority to fund and the resources to fund, but build in a scenario in which you're trying to fully fund all of the needs that you have out there. Um, and that has to start with a capital needs assessment. And most organizations, at least in my perspective, um, I know the organizations that I work for, we never really had a full assessment of our need. We always knew that we needed more than what was available, um, but we never had a clear cut answer to exactly what we needed. So this is a, a good opportunity for uh, folks to build that into their, their um, scenarios. And as I was talking about before, with respect to pensions, really important to make sure that you're analyzing how market returns will impact your UAL amortization. Um, this chart comes from uh, CalPERS, and they they give forecasts. A base, they, they basically do what what we want, right? Which is they give us a baseline forecast that assumes what you will pay as a UAL, the UAL amortization payment, assuming that the discount rate is achieved. That's the orange line that you see you see in the graph. That's a six point eight percent assumed rate of return. And then they provide you with alternative UAL payments if the actual rate of return exceeds the assumed, right? So the um, um, gray line is the 10.8% average return and the blue line is 3% average return. And they say, if you get a 3% return, your UAL payments are gonna be substantially higher than what they are if we get a 6% return. It's somewhat common sense. Um, and then they tell you that there's a 90% chance that your UAL will fall between these levels. That's helpful, um, but also problematic, um, but underscores the need to develop scenarios. I mean, this is real data that comes from one of my clients, a city that has an approximate $135 million general fund budget in 2028, 
there's a 90% chance that their pension expense will be somewhere between 5.7 and 12.7 million. That's a pretty broad number for an organization of this side, size um, with an almost $8 million swing in, in what they may need in just a few years. Now, if they cannot afford to sort of fully fund the, the most negative side of that, um, it probably is important to begin developing plans and scenarios. Um, maybe this will result in folks saying, hey, we need to start setting aside uh, pension resources outside of our trust fund to create a stabilization reserve or a section 115 trust for pensions and OPEPs where we control the investments um, in order to deal with this uncertainty that exists out there. And again, this is just their safety expense. They, they would have a similar issue with their non-safety pension plan um, as well. Which leads us to question three. Kristen, if you could pop that up for us. Thank you. Do you stress test your multi-year financial plan? So if you answered that you don't have a multi-year financial plan, the answer would be no. Um, but for the 55% who do have a plan, do you run alternative scenarios um, around revenues and expenditures and evaluate those outcomes? We'll give everybody a minute to answer. And somebody asked a question, will we be sending the slide deck with the recording? I think the answer to that is yes. And here are the results. Do you stress test your multi-year financial plan? 14%, we had 103 respondents, 14 of them said yes. Um, out of the 103 respondents, 57 or 55% said no, and 31% said they were not sure. So this is not surprising. Again, most of my experience with financial forecasts, um, particularly in the, in the California space where I, I do most of my work, is that individuals have, individual entities have um, an, a, a forecast in their budget. They do some high level assessment of revenues and expenditures. And if they identify gaps, they may talk at a very high level about what the key drivers are of those anticipated gaps, but they're really not taking it to the next step. They're not analyzing their results under different expectations for revenue and expenditure outcomes. And the plan is not as detailed in that it's not assessing things down the horizon that uh, the organization may need to do. So I'm not surprised by this, but I do think um, and, and hopefully um, the pandemic, the COVID pandemic has shown finance officers the benefit of really trying to anticipate some of this. Um, you know, federal stimulus aid to local governments uh, was very significant. And in the absence of that, um, I, I think there would have been a lot more pain for local governments um, in trying to grapple with the financial circumstances they faced. I don't, I don't think that was, that, that'll, you know, be, you know, universal. I think there will be pockets of severe weakness, but there was a substantial amount of financial assistance that came to local government employers that, you know, is, is uncertain if that would ever happen again um, with, you know, um, the way the federal government is today. And so I think it's a real risk, and but I think it underscores the need to develop alternative scenarios um, and evaluate how well or what your plan would be, um, particularly while times are, are still good. So thanks, Kristen, if you could close that. We're, we're moving towards the end here. Um, so moving beyond the forecast, um, what I recommend to my clients is that they come up with a plan, that they evaluate and tailor options and scenarios to meet their unique needs. Remember that no two agencies will be exactly alike. Um, and so you have to spend some time to understand the risks as they pertain to you but also your risk tolerance levels. You know, if you have a very significant reserve um, by, by policy or ordinance or whatever it may be, um, you may be in a better position to weather storms. Evaluate and look for service delivery efficiencies when you're doing your scenarios. 
Look for debt restructuring and refundings if possible. Look for opportunities to accelerate pay down of your unfunded benefits to free up long-term funds um, or to build up new or other strategic reserves. Evaluate labor cost considerations and employee compensation restructuring. This is really important. A lot of governmental employers today are grappling with high levels of vacancy and significant labor demands for wage increases, investing in capital and so on. And remember, importantly, that all outcomes will deviate from your forecast. Um, a forecast is, a, is an estimate of what is likely to happen. It is not a prediction. You should not judge how far off you were from that prediction. Um, you are trying your best to assess under normal circumstances where things will go um, and stress those assumptions um, using general economic uh, models. <laughs> Next slide. In conclusion, hard to predict a recession, particularly its depth, diffusion, and duration. Forecasters today are seeing an increased risk for GDP contraction in 2023 than previously uh, estimated. Um, and no one has a crystal ball, uh, but they're nearing a 50% assumption that there will be a contraction. The economy right now is faced with, uh, whoops, excuse me, some difficulties, including high inflation, um, coupled with a strong job market, low unemployment, that signals the Fed will continue to raise interest rates that will have broad impacts on the economy, the housing market, and so on. Long-term financial planning is an important tool for finance officers to enhance strategic decision-making and build support uh, from various stakeholders in their budget process and helps to make sure those decisions are being made over a with a long-term perspective in mind. Scenario analysis will highlight challenges over the near term that may arise due to unforeseen economic circumstances and will help you to build a resilient financial organization. Just a few case studies here. Um, GovInvest does a lot of work in this space. Um, they recently engaged with Sancho, uh, Rancho Santa Margarita Water District in California to help restructure its unfunded pension obligation payments to optimize cash flow. Uh, so this organization, went with a fresh start, which limited the district's unfunded liability payment um, to $3.1 million a year, which reduced the savings over the next 10-year period by about $5 million. So this was an entity that had some uh, cash flow issues, um, but they needed to make a decision about whether they were going to, you know, essentially fresh start their full UAL or continue with these high payments. They chose and made a decision based upon good data um, using the forecast tools that are available to them um, you know, to, 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 to implement a, a fresh start. Um, Nye County, Nevada um, works with GovInvest and their labor cost management software and helps them um, to prepare their budget, their workforce planning and their negotiations um, and to look at different scenarios and models over time. They can respond quickly um, and accurately to union requests for costing or different proposals at the table. Um, and it helps to build trust um, across the organization with their labor partners. And also um, in the city of Benicia, California, GovInvest used their pension and OPEB tools to help the city evaluate what to do, what were their best options with a fund balance of nearly $6 million that they had set aside um, to offset the rising impact of, of pension obligations. Um, the software and forecasting tool that GovInvest has helped them to make the best decision um, how to and when to um, utilize those resources. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kristen. All right, thank you so much, Adam. And thank you everyone for your attendance and so many people stayed on till the very end. I did wanna make an announcement that GovInvest launched our, launched our financial health check program in January. Um, we really just take a dive into your uh, agency's unique um, challenges, any kind of factors you have coming up for the year ahead. And we help you to begin uh, building that strategic roadmap to make sure you're preparing today for tomorrow's possibilities. If you are interested, whether you're a client or a member of our financial forecasting community, please do reach out to me. You can email me at kristen at govinvest.com with any questions you have to get that scheduled. I also dropped a direct link into the chat box where you can click on that link and schedule it yourself. 
Um, the couple of questions that we do ask during the consultation, just for example, what are your big priorities and initiatives for this year? Um, do you think that you'll have a surplus or a deficit this year? What are any economic trends that you're watching for? Um, when will you have your next round of negotiations? And um, when was the last time you reviewed compensation um, at an organizational wide level? So we'll take a look at these, um, these answers to these questions and we'll help you put together a plan for your agency that's very customized. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. We will be sending around a link to the recording. I will send the slides as well. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on our next monthly webinar.